Babel II rising. How much more can we take? Now, there are some self-righteous people that every time that something happens and there are disasters and they're like we have this flood that went on all this past week and recovering from that, and it's very interesting that now they find out that all of the money that was to be used for hurricane emergencies have been spent on the illegal immigrants living in hotels, buying food, using up all of our money, and showing that this is a deliberate act on their own. Now, why would God allow that? Well, because he looks at the whole overall picture. And there are various degrees of people who believe in God, don't believe in God, various degrees of those who think they love God, and so forth. So we have the same situation here. We know that God judges because of sin, and different things happen. But also we know from the book of Ecclesiastes that time and chance happens to all. The fulfilling of prophecy is not time and chance, but how it falls on different individuals is, in many cases, time and chance. Now, let's come to Luke 13. Let's see what Jesus said concerning such a thing, because the ones who are not affected, many of them look upon it and say, oh, well, they deserved it. Well, you don't know whether they deserved it or not. You take everyone affected by this hurricane, you can't say that, oh, they deserved it. No, God wants also to know when something happens like this, what are you going to do? And one of the com commandments that God expects everyone to keep, whether they're converted or not, is love your neighbor as yourself. So the question becomes, when these disasters come up this way, what are you going to do to help? And I think that we are seeing a great response in helping all those people in North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, and North Florida, because many of them have lost everything. And yet we have a government so sinful, so bent on following Satan the devil, that they only have $750 to give to those who are afflicted and have spent all of the money on the migrants. So let's look at Luke 13 and let's see what Jesus says about these circumstances that come along and what we need to do. And I think that there's hopefully enough love of neighbor that God will hold back his heavy hand of judgment. Now, we don't know what's going to happen as we go down the line, but we need to remember this. Verse 1, Luke 13. Now, at that time, there were the present some of those who were telling Jesus about the Galileans who whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? Now think about it. If we sit in our warm living room watching the video and we don't have mercy and compassion upon those who have been afflicted or have the judgment, well, they deserve it, okay? Well, what is the wages of sin? Death. And that's for everyone who sins. So, don't look upon those who suffer these things in that way that it is because they have sinned. 
No one knows their lives except God. So he says this, verse 3, No, I tell you, but if you do not repent, that is, come to God, his way, repent, you shall all likewise perish. And that probably happened when Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Verse 4, or the 18 on whom the tower of Shiloh fell and killed them. Do you suppose that these were debtors above all men who dwelled in Jerusalem? See? No. It's a difficult proposition. Time and chance happens to everyone. So let's hope that there is enough of neighborly love that God will hold his heavy hand of continued judgment upon us. Now, we don't know if it will be, but he says that we should not have that kind of attitude because that is not right. Now, let's come back here to Amos, the seventh chapter. Now, Amos had a pretty heavy, heavy, heavy message of repentance and condemnation of sin. And so we come to a point here that's very interesting indeed in Amos, the seventh chapter, and how Amos pleaded with God, and let's see what God did. So maybe we should include this in on our prayers when we look at all that's going on, even with the immigrants and even with disasters that are happening. Okay, verse 1. And the Lord made me see this, and behold, he is forming locusts at the beginning of the growth of the late grass, even behold, the late grass after the king's mowing. And it came to pass when they had made an end of eating the tender plants of the land. Then I said, Oh, Lord, forgive, I pray you, how can Jacob stand? for he is small. Now notice what happened. Remember what it says in Isaiah, the first chapter? He says, come together, let us reason. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Okay, there's forgiveness. Look what God did because of what Amos prayed. And the Lord repented for this and said, it shall not be. And the Lord made me see this, and behold, the Lord God was calling to contend by fire. And it consumed the great deep, and it was devouring part of it. He was seeing what was going to happen before it took place. Now notice again, what did Amos do? And so this is what we need to do when these things come along. We see prophecies be fulfilled. Yes, they're going to be terrible. But we don't need to come with an attitude of condemnation. Well, they deserve that and even more. Because notice what Amos was able to do. Then I said, Ah, oh, Lord God, I pray you, cease. How can Jacob stand? For he is small. And the Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, says the Lord God. Now, that's quite a thing. Think of that. See? He did it twice. Now, let's see the third time. So, Amos, you know, lots of times we get the, the attitude or the op or opinion that comes along, you know, well, they're all sinners. They're all condemned. They all need it, and God's judgment is, is worthy to come upon them. Well, would you like to be in the middle of it? Would you like to be in the middle of that hurricane down there? Would you like to live in New York City where the immigrants are taking over or Chicago where there's going to be bloodshed this summer between the immigrants and the, and the black community? It's already laid out that it's going to happen. It's going to be terrible. And what are we going to say? Oh, they deserve it. God, go get them. No, we need to take the attitude of Amos. 
And he made me see this, verse 7, and behold, the Lord is standing upon a wall by a plumb line with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said to me, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and it shall not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the holy places of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will raise up against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So there we have it. And then the elders of the community came to Amos and said, well, why are you saying all of these things against us? And he said, look, guys, I'll just paraphrase it. I'm not a prophet. I was shepherding sheep. And God told me, go speak the words that I will give you. Okay. Now let's look at, it, at another one. Let's come to Psalm 78. And this is quite a psalm. I want you to read the whole psalm so that you will understand it all the way through. Psalm 78. And think about this. Remember when Aaron made the golden calf. And Moses came down with the Ten Commandments in his hand. He had been up there 40 days and 40 nights. And here Aaron made a golden calf and made a great feast and said, it's a feast unto the Lord. And God said to Moses, stand aside. Let me exterminate the whole thing of the children of Israel because they have sinned. And he said, oh, Lord God, blot out my name from the book of life, but don't, don't, destroy the children of Israel. So God held back his hand. He held back his hand from destroying Aaron, who was responsible for it because of Moses' pleadings. And then he executed judgment against only those who were directly involved in that rebellion and setting up the golden calf. Let's pick it up here in verse 27. He also rained flesh from upon them like dust, the winged birds like the sand of the sea, and he led them fall in the midst of their camp, all around the camp, so they ate and were filled to the full. And he gave them that which they craved, and they turned not away from their lust. But while the food was still in their mouths, the wrath of the Lord came upon them, and the strongest of them struck down the chosen men of Israel. Again, selective punishment. Verse 32, For all this they still sinned and did not believe in his wonderful works. Therefore, he ended their days in vanity and their years in terror. When he slew them, now, that's what we're up against right now. A lot of death, a lot of rapes, a lot of different things coming along, a lot of people wondering what is happening. When he slew them, they sought him, and they turned back and sought after God earnestly. Now, this is what's happening right now today with the different things going on in America. Then they remembered that God was their rock and the Most High God was their Redeemer. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouths. They didn't come back to God all the way that they should. For they lied to him with their tongues. For their heart was not steadfast with him, neither were they faithful in his covenant. But, he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and not, did not destroy them. Yea, many times he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes away and does not come again. 
So then it says, how often did they provoke him? So this is the story that we're looking at right now today. So we need to pray for all of those involved in helping. And since the government can't help them, many, many different ones from different states and different people, the government wouldn't supply one helicopter and the neighbors supplied over a hundred helicopters to help get things in to help them. So when you look at all of that damage that is going on there, you look at the other things with the immigrants going on there, we need to pray that God will hold back his hand, give us a space of repentance, give us a time to assess things the way that we need to and not have a heart of condemnation because they suffer these things. Now let's continue on with Sabbath services, and we will entitle this Babel II Rising. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, we will see that while God is busy preparing his people for the resurrection, Satan is busy preparing for his final kingdom, which will be Babel II, and it is rising. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 10, and let's see the first Babel, okay? And how that started. And then we'll look at Genesis 11. Let's come back here, Genesis 10, and we will see how soon after the flood that things began to get out of hand. Now, as we project forward, remember that God told us, Christ did, that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And that is that the thoughts of everyone is only evil all of the time. Okay, well, it didn't take long for that to begin to happen after the flood. So let's read it here. Verse 8, Cush begat Nimrod, and Nimrod began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter against the Lord and leading people away from God. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter against the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Then it lists all the other cities that he also started. Now let's come over here to chapter 11. Let's see what they were doing. Because people, when they gather together and think that it, in numbers, they can accomplish what they want to accomplish. They can do what they want to do. And I'm going to read to you from a special report concerning what they are doing in building Babel 2. Now, Genesis 11 and verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Now, we're close to that right now with the English language. And it came to pass, as they were migrating toward the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they made brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. Now, Josephus records that they had this bitumen or, or asphalt, which they would make the tower that they're going to build waterproof just in case God flooded the world again, okay? Well, he promised he wouldn't do it, but nevertheless, that's what they figured. And you will see any study of ancient Babylon that they used this bitumen to, to make things waterproof and to waterproof their boats and so forth, okay? And they said, let us build a city and a tower with its top reaching into the heavens. Now, what do we have today? Same thing. How far into space are we going to go? Well, the truth is men are not going to go very far. It's all they can do to get to the moon and get to a, the International Space Station, but that's about it. And let us establish a name for ourselves, 
lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. Okay? Because they knew God was going to put each one of them in the inheritance that he, he designated for each one, as we find in Acts, the 17th chapter. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. And behold, the people are one. They all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Now, nothing which they have imagined to do will be restrained from them. And he has the history of before the flood to look at at the same time. Okay. So this is exactly where we are today. Look at what we are imagining to do. Look at the increase of knowledge. Look at AI. Look at all of the computer things that we have. Look at the things that they're designing to go into space. Look at the things that they are designing for manufacturing and whatever that the intelligence and inventiveness of men have come a long, long way. So God said, come, let us go down there and confound their language so uh, they cannot understand one another's speech. Little sidebar. There is no such thing as a sacred language. Whatever language is, who made it? God did, right? So if you get a Bible in your language, you don't need sacred names that the Jews try and palm off on people. If it's rightly translated into your language, that's the sacred word of God to you. Let's come in and look at something else here. Let's come to the book of Daniel and see how this is all expanded, coming down to our time, Daniel, the second chapter. Now, at the time that the children of Israel, they went off into captivity and the Syrians took them off in the 700s BC, and then in 586, they were taken off from 604 to 586 B.C. The Jews were taken off to Babylon. Now in Babylon, the first wave that Nebuchadnezzar took back were the intelligentsia of the Jews, which included Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were put in with the wise ones of Babylon to learn the language and so forth that it came out that they were smarter than any of them. And then we have something spectacular take place. So think of this. God dealt directly with Nebuchadnezzar in a dream, right? Okay. Think back. How about Pharaoh and Joseph? Did God deal directly with the Pharaoh in a dream? Virtually the same thing? And no one could be found to interpret it but Joseph? And he was put in charge, second in charge of Egypt, under Pharaoh. Same thing with Daniel, when he interpreted the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, he was put in charge of Babylon, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were his assistant. Well, that made it much easier for the Jews in Babylon, okay? But here's, here's the whole thing. Concerning the dream, Nebuchadnezzar made an impossible demand upon the ones who were supposed to interpret dreams, he said, you tell me the dream, and you tell me the interpretation of the dream. And he said, we can't do it. He says, if you don't do it, it's your head. So they came back, and Daniel said, hold off for a little bit. 
Let's get together and pray about it, and God revealed it to him. Daniel 2 and verse 19. Because we need to start here, because at the end time, we have Babylon the Great, as we covered last week. And all of this combined together is Babylon 2 rising. I'm going to read you some astounding things that are going on that most people don't even know. But it's happening, okay? But let's pick it up here, verse 19. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. And Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. Now, here's another sidebar in studying the Bible. Do you want to be wise? Do you want to be able to think correctly? Do you want to be able to keep your life from becoming a total disaster because you're emotionally ruined and upset? You come to God. He gives wisdom. He gives understanding. He will help you out of those troubles, even on a personal level. Now notice, God is not only in charge of everything, and not only does he know when a sparrow falls, he knows what's going on in the whole world, in everything, everywhere, all of the time. Okay, let's pick it up here. Verse 21, and he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. We'll have to see how the election comes out. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. Now, that's what we have in the Bible with the prophecies, the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and dwells in the light. Then he says, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we desire of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Okay? So then Daniel came to Arioch and said, Take me to the king. So Arioch took him to the king. Verse 36, and the king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, that was his Babylonian name, that's verse 26, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Now notice, verse 22, here's another important thing. The more that we know and understand that everything comes from God, and that when we come to a point that we know certain things to a certain point, let us not pull a Job. That is, let us not think that we have arrived and now we can start telling God what to do. Now, Daniel answered the king and said, The secret which the king demanded cannot be shown to the king by the wise men and enchanters, astrologers, and and magicians, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and make known to King Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days, from the time from Nebuchadnezzar right on down to the end. And then he tells him exactly what he saw, the vision they had of gold and the, then the silver and the brass and the iron and the iron mixed with clay. And that comes right down to the end of the time, the latter days, okay? Right here, we'll come chapter 2 and verse 42. And here's where we are in this great statue, starting with Nebuchadnezzar, down to our days. Verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were part iron and part clay, the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. That's how this coming Babel number two is going to come. And whereas you saw the iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mix themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cling to one another, even as iron does not combine with clay. And in the days of these kings, 
Now, we've read that. We'll read it again here in a little bit. The God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and it won't be left to other people. That's why we keep the Feast of Tabernacles, because the Feast of Tabernacles tells us about this kingdom that God is going to set up. Okay? So that's quite a thing. All right? Now, we come to chapter 7. We find the same thing. Come down to the last day. Chapter 8 comes down to the last day. Chapter 11 and 12 comes down to the last day. Okay? Now let's come to Revelation 13. Now we know two things for sure, okay? Number one, Satan is deceiving the whole world, which means he controls it. If he deceives you, he's controlling you, even if he's not right there doing it personally. If you're following the dictates of what he wants, he is controlling you. Now remember this. Here's a very important thing to remember, which will be a whole sermon in itself. There are two good and evil interpretations. Number one, God's. What's good? What's evil? What's right? What's wrong? What's sinful? What is righteousness? Satan has the same thing. His good and evil is the exact, exact opposite. That which is evil is good and that which is good is evil. And that's what we see coming upon us today. Okay? Then here we see the beast rising up out of the sea, and it has all the aspects that it talks about in Daniel, the book of Daniel, all contained right there in verse 2 about the beast that, that he saw. Okay? Seven heads and ten horns. Okay? Ten toes right? Ten kings. Then there are seven heads with that. That's Satan's system. Now, it's rising up out of the sea, as John has said. He saw it. That means it is coming. And what are they going to do? How is it going to be done? All right? Go online and look up UN Assembly 2030. They have plans to institute a world government. And that will be the government that is here. Verse 2, Revelation 13. Beast I saw was like a leopard, feet like the feet of a bear, mouth like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power for his throne and great authority. Comes from Satan the devil. That which he says is good is evil. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. A deadly wound was healed. But the whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. A whole world system. Seven heads, ten horns. We have that repeated again in Revelation 17. And they worship the dragon. Okay? And we know that the other beast is the papacy and bringing all religions together. Because in order to make this have any kind of sticking power, they have got to have an authorized religion. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? Now, there are some today who say that, that King Charles III of England is the beast power, you know, or Antichrist. No, he's not. No. Is he dynamic? No. Does he draw a lot of attention? No. Do people follow after him and fawn him? No. Because when the beast power comes, he's going to be magnificent. And it says here, who's like the beast, who has the power to make war against him. So there will come a time of a temporary peace. Now, we don't know exactly how that comes, which tells us we have a considerable length of time as things develop. 
but we need to keep alert as we see him developing. He speaks great things and blasphemies were given to him. Authority was given to him to continue 42 months, that is, after the deadly wound is healed. Okay, now then, let's see how it is rising. I have in my hand a complete report on many organizations in the world who are calling for a world government via the UN. Now, here's the title of it. A World Call to Action. See? Now, you don't hear this on the news, but it's going on, and you can see it includes the whole world in two of its emblems there. And this is online, July 2024, roundtable on the human future, a world call to action on the multitude of crises now enfolding humanity. Now, as I mentioned the other day, crises in Greek means judgment. We have many crises. Let me just read you some of the, the participating organizations and world thought leaders. Of course, that includes Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum. So you've got the World Economic Forum. You've got the UN. Now you have all of this. And there are over 20 organizations listed, over 25. I'll just read a couple here. Global Challenges Foundation, Global Engineering Alliance, Global Governments Forum, Global Restoration Collaboration, Global Youth Security Council, Millennial Alliance for Humanity, Natural Capitalism Solution, Revolution in the 21st Century, Transitioned Earth, World Academy of Arts and Sciences, hosted by the Club of Rome and the Council of Human Future. You ever hear of that? Not a thing, see? You don't hear of any of this in the news, but it's going on. They are planning. They are looking at the things that we see today, and they see the things exactly as Jesus forecast that they would be. And that is, as Jesus said, it would be as in the days of Noah. Now, here we have all the crises that are taking place. The human predicament. Now, did Jesus say there would be wars and rumors of wars? Did he say there would be plagues and famines and different things? Yes, all of these. So they're thinking about all of this. Humanity is facing its greatest emergency, a crisis consisting of many interlinked catastrophic uh, risks. Now, what's the famous saying of the Democrat? Never waste a crisis. Now, that has to also be Satan's motto as well. The crisis is already here and will get worse. Its combined scale and impact are so great that few grasp it. Together, these risks endanger our ability to maintain a civilization, possibly even to survive as a species. Global solutions are now urgent. To act later will be too late. Now, that's why God is going to bring the kingdom of God when he is ready. So they say this, the crisis is vast, complex, interconnected. It will affect everyone on earth for generations to come. Now, that's what it would be if God wouldn't intervene. There is at present no plan of action to resolve it, nor even a consorted effort to develop one. So what they are doing, they are saying, we are developing this. Dimensions of the human predicament highlighted by leading international organizations who took part in the Foundation Roundtable on the Human Future, 
July 27th and 28th include. Here's some of the things that they are saying, and these are true. But has man ever been able to take care of his own problems? Well, maybe for a while. But what happens? Satan is still there and comes back around in a different form. All right? Now, let's read the first one. Now, think about what's in the news today. Think about what's happened with the floods that we've had in America. Think about the Ukraine war. Think about the war in the Middle East right now between the Jews and the Hezbollah and Hamath and Iran. Those things have got to be settled in order for the temple to be built. But those things are going on. Do we have famine? Yes. Do we have plague? Yes. So it says here, let me read just some of them. Humanity faces global catastrophic risk now arriving together. See? They pose a mounting security threat to all nations and to every person. True. See? Just like Jesus said, Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. Global risks call for global solutions. Now, how are you going to do that? See, because everyone has to submit to this rising Babel too. There is currently no world plan for action dealing with all these risks or even agreement to form one. So now they're calling for it. There is a universal failure of leadership and governments to address the global problems we face. The current system of international cooperation is clearly not fit to meet the unprecedented challenges humanity confronts. Stronger international governance is becoming essential. So this shows how it's going to come. Now, this polycrisis is an interconnected web of challenges, including climate change, biodiversity loss, global poisoning, food insecurity, resource depletion, retreat from democracy, nuclear proliferation, spread of war, uncontrolled use of AI, misinformation, economic, social, and gender inequality, rising inequality, failing health care systems, and geopolitical instability, these spell greater insecurity for all. Now, there are a whole lot more I could read about it. But let me read just a couple more things from this, because they think that they all get together, we get the best minds together, and we're going to solve the problem. Well, we'll see if that will work or not. So here it is. It is concluded that fresh hope, positivity, well-being, and inspiration are all to be gained from working together to restore our world. Huh. See? And in this whole document, not one word about God. They're going to present their solution, and everybody's going to have to submit. And it gives a little more of the report. All right. Let's see if they can do it. Has any plan of man yet succeeded in bringing true peace, true prosperity, and service to people? Any nation? No. Once in a while, you get it for a few years. Okay. Let's see what's going to happen. Let's come to Romans, the first chapter, because they think if they get all of the smartest minds in the world together, that they will be able to come up with a solution that will work, that we can save mankind, that we can get along with each other. See, But the problem is they don't realize that Satan is the one who is moving all of this along. 
They don't realize that this is what God has prophesied for thousands of years. Now, here, Romans 1, we've gone over this before. Now, could they know God if they would seek God his way? They could. Even if it were just in the letter of the law, that would be enough to bring a relatively prosperous society. Not counting salvation. This is not counting salvation unto eternal life. That's what God is working behind the scenes right now in every one of us. We are being prepared to take over the world when Christ returns, to rule the world. See, that's what it's all about. And here are the stakes that have been laid out that men think, again, without God, we can make it. If we just cooperate, huh, why hasn't it worked in the past? Well, Romans 1 tells us, verse 16, here's what they need to study if they want to do any real good, but they won't do it because Satan has divided down the whole world into various religions and they hate each other, and they fight each other, and that's what's going on in the Middle East right now. Verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, both to the Jew first and to the Greek. Okay, So God is not holding back from anyone. How many Bibles has he produced in the world so that they could read it, they could know it, they could understand it in their own language, all right? Now then, if you want to know the right way, Paul is telling us, and that's why, brethren, we need to pray that God is going to open the doors so that all the churches of God everywhere can preach the gospel as a warning message to the world, because we're right down to the time where it's, all of this is going to take place. We're not out now in a situation that we're going to get salvation just for ourselves. No, we've got to be educated so that we can take over the world. But we have to warn the world of what is going to come, because this Babylon 2 rising is going to be destroyed, as we find in the book of Revelation, when Christ returns. Okay? Now, if they want to know about God, verse 17, for therein, that is the gospel, that is the word of God, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith unto faith. You must believe God, and then God will give you his faith, both. You have faith to do in the letter of the law. You have faith to do in the spirit of the law. One leads to a longer physical life. The other leads to eternal life, faith to faith. According as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And that faith is first belief in the true God. But they don't want to believe in the true God. That's what this document here tells us. They want to work it out themselves and bring all the groups together. And you all agree together, and it says there in Revelation 17 that God is going to give them a heart to all believe it. So it will happen. But notice what it's going to bring. Indeed, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven upon all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How do they do that? Oh, we don't need the Bible. Oh, that just for the Jews, or that just for the Catholics, or that just for the Protestants, or that just for the Muslims, or that just for the Hindus. Okay? All wrong. Only those who have the Spirit of God and are in a true church of God will be able to understand. And when it comes down to the end, 
We have got to have the faith to whether we live or not. Okay? Because it's going to come down to a time of total evil, and the only good will be those who have the Spirit of God. And the prophecy in Revelation 6, as we saw last time, there will be a martyrdom of the saints. Why? Because Satan will make a war against us. And they will know where we are and who we are. They'll have the means to track us all down. Now notice, they hold it back. They don't say, oh, well, we're all here together. Now, you all have a Bible right there. Now, let's open it up, and here's where we begin. No. They have all their experts, all their wise men, okay? Suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest among them, for God has manifested it to them. Okay, They could no. For the invisible things of him are perceived from the creation of the world and being understood by the things which are made, both as eternal power and Godhead, so they're without excuse. And especially today, there's no excuse. You look at the intricacies of how things are made, and it's totally stunning. It is absolutely amazing. Because when they knew God, now right after the flood, they knew God. But in what, three generations, here comes Nimrod? When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their own reasonings, and their foolish hearts were darkening. Here's the vanity of their own reasonings right here in this report. And there are probably thousands of other pages that actually are the backbone of everything that they want to do. While professing themselves to be the wise ones, that's what they're doing. They're saying, we're going to solve the problems. We understand the crises. We look at what is happening. Here's the solution. Okay. and change the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed creatures and creeping things. Okay, Different religions. And what did the Pope just say recently? Paving the way for what is coming. All religions are a path to God. Hmm? How can that be? It's not. There's one way. For this cause. Now, here's what happens. Whenever you leave God out, you bring upon yourself problems and difficulties. They come in many different ways, and many different things take place. And people don't know why they're here, what they're doing, what they need to do. And now we're confronted with all of the sin and all of the drugs and all of the things that we have in a society today. And that's because God abandoned them. Now, we will see there are three abandonments, and you don't want to suffer the three abandonments, because if you do, you're in terrible shape. Verse 24, For this cause God also abandoned them to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to disgrace their own bodies between themselves. Like I said, two trees of good and evil. One Satan, one God. That's why you go through the book of Proverbs, right and wrong, good and evil. That tells you on a very simple introductory basis. And it gets down to Sexual perversion always does. What's the headline today concerning sexual perversions? 
His name is Diddy. And they now know he was worse than Epstein. And that there were literally thousands of Hollywood that is owned body and soul by Satan, the devil, participating in them. who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. The lie is, we can do anything we want to. We are strong, we are prosperous, we are right, we deserve it, we'll make it happen. No, you won't make anything happen unless you do it God's way. They worship and serve the created things more than the one who is creator, who is blessed into the ages, amen. Okay, that's what happened, you know? Just, just like some of us right here, some of the people you know, you try and talk to them about God, and you, they look upon you as an idiot. They look upon you as, well, who are you? See, well, they'll soon find out, because you're going to meet God one of two ways. Either you repent, and you're converted, and you meet him as a resurrected son or daughter of God, or you reject him, and you follow Satan's way, and you're going to meet him at the edge of the lake of fire like the rich man and say, oh, give me a little water. Okay. Okay, verse 26, for this cause, God abandoned them to disgraceful passions, for even their women changed their natural use of sex into that which is contrary to nature. And I won't elaborate on that, but that is a, a tremendous thing that has taken place. And add on top of that, abortion. And that's what we're suffering the judgment of. In the same man also, the men having left the natural use of sex for women were inflamed in their lustful passions toward one another, men with men, shamelessly committing lewd acts and receiving back into them uh, within themselves a fitting penalty for their error. What is that fitting penalty? You can't think correctly. You, your mind is always on sex. And then the diseases that come with it. And they don't tell you all those diseases because they don't want it to get out there. And they don't tell you all the work that they do scientifically on these aborted fetuses. So we're stuck right now here in America, right in between this whole judgment of God and whether God will hold back his hand with a bit of mercy as Amos pleaded with God. Oh, Lord, don't do this too much. Okay, so we can pray that, but so that we can have an opportunity to preach the gospel. So then it goes, it goes on even further. Now notice, God is righteous, God is judge, and here's what he will do. If there's no repentance, verse 28, in exact proportion as they did not consent to have God in their knowledge. No, here it is. We'll solve all of the crises. We'll solve all of our problems. Not one word about God. Nothing mentioned about the Bible. Strictly relying on the intelligentsia of the wise ones who then are inspired by who? Satan the devil. All right? That's what we're looking at. Now, did not consent to have God in their knowledge. God abandoned them. That's the third abandonment. See? to a reprobate mind. That means you can't think what is right and good. Okay. You think you can solve the problem. You think you have a good solution, but you try it for a while, and guess what? It doesn't work. And if you don't turn to God, there's no way of changing it, see? Reprobate mind to practice those things that are immoral. And then it lists all the immorality of everything that's taking place in the world today 
in every single society around the world. So this Babylon rising, number two, is going to be quite a thing indeed. And they have to bring all nations into submission to it. They have to, they have to take all of these crises and say, now we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to do the other thing, okay? And that's all of Satan, the devil. And as we look into the prophecies going down, we need to understand this. Number one, there needs to be a temple built in Jerusalem. However long that will take to end this war, repair Gaza and Hezbollah and all of that, and build the temple, and they have to have it in the right place, we don't know. And then the thing that kicks off the tribulation is, is that there's war in heaven, Satan is cast down, he comes down and possesses the beast who has received the deadly wound that is healed, and then the all-out war at the end begins at that point, okay? So this Babylon 2 rising is going to be a tremendous thing indeed. So let's keep our eyes open, let's keep our Bibles open, Let's pray and study every day. Let's yield to God. Let's understand that everything we have comes from God. There's nothing that we haven't received, but God has given it. And that we yield to God so that we can do the things that God wants us to do.